sorry for the delay. We had a, a one technical technological hiccup. But welcome to the Just Tech Platform launch event. My name is Michael Miller, and I, along with my partner, Greta Byram, Greta, if you would come on screen really quick, I direct the Just Tech program at the Social Science Research Council. Hi, Greta. We've got a, a jam-packed program for you today, and I know that you are chomping at the bit to hear from our very special guests, and I won't keep them from you long, but I do need to get a couple of things out of the way first. If you would like to live tweet about this event, we encourage you to do so, and we encourage you to use the hashtag JustTech, J-U-S-T-T-E-C-H, and feel free to tag and follow the new Just Tech Twitter account at SSRC underscore just underscore tech. To give a preview of today's program, we'll have some brief words of introduction and inspiration, including remarks by former SSRC president, Dr. Alondra Nelson. Following this, we'll give a short introduction to the Just Tech program and a live demo of the platform we're launching today. Directly after that, we've got an all-star panel that includes Drs. Safia Noble, Ruha Benjamin, and Tim Nick Ebru. And we'll wrap the event with ways that you can get involved with Just Tech and try to answer any questions you may have for us at that time. Excuse me. But I know that just the Just Tech program, the Just Tech Fellowship and today's esteemed panelists attract enthusiastic interest from far and wide including from many outside of the academy. And so I don't assume that everyone joining the call today knows a whole lot about the organization where I work, the Social Science Research Council for the, or SSRC. For those of you unfamiliar with our work, SSRC is an independent nonprofit institution committed to mobilizing knowledge for the public good. For close to a century, the council has cultivated research about society's most pressing concerns from climate change to life amid an emergent pandemic to the disparate and disproportionate harms of novel technology. In short, we are a support organization that through research, that through grants, fellowships, workshops, media, and a variety of other resources, the council offers support for researchers. The Just Tech program builds on this tradition now I'll have more to say about this in a moment, but I wanna take a note, I wanna make a note at the top of this program. Just Tech is cognizant of the fact that rigorous research and analysis are brought to bear on the problems of tech, inequity, and social justice from folks who do not identify as scholars, much less as social scientists. Today, vital insights are produced by journalists, artists, and activists alike. Moreover, Many of the leading scholars in the tech justice field are themselves committed activists. We recognize that for the just tech community, the lines between research, practice, action, and service are often blurred, and we celebrate that. Which is why it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first guest, someone who embodies this multiplicity, who, who contains these multitudes. Dr. Alondra Nelson is the Harold F. Linder Chair and Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study, an independent research center in Princeton, New Jersey. Dr. Nelson's contributions to the study of science, technology, race, and social citizenship and their intersections are in explored in her acclaimed books, The Social Life of DNA, Race, Reparations, and Reconciliation After the Genome, Genetics and the Unsettled Past, The Collision of DNA, race and history. Body and Soul, the Black Panther Movement, uh, the Black Panther Party and the fight against medical discrimination, Afrofuturism and Technicolor, race, technology, and everyday life. Dr. Nelson leads the White House. Uh, Dr. Nelson leads the White, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, was the 14th president of the Social Science Research Council and served on the steering committee convened by the Ford and MacArthur Foundations that gave us the Just Tech program. And I'm getting word right now uh, that she's having 
uh, some difficulty joining. Uh, so uh, with apologies, <laughs> Alondra uh, Nelson will not introduce this section of the program, um, but will introduce uh, our, our panel in, in, in a, a, a few brief moments. All right, uh, let's, let's move on then. So what we're gonna do then is, is start with the uh, introduction of, of the program and, and the platform, and then we'll give a short demo um, about the platform and how it works. And then we'll move to our panel and, and Dr. Nelson will give uh, remarks before that panel begins. So the Just Tech program is premised on a simple but seemingly radical idea that technology are neither neutral nor objective, that technology are designed by humans, that they inherit our biases, our prejudices, our assumptions, our blind spots, our flawed data sets, and our limited concepts. And that technology, especially information and communication technology, are social tools, and social tools are never used outside of a social context. They interact with social structures that include race, gender, class, disability, among many other markers of difference and hierarchy. And so technology may just as soon reinforce or augment inequity and injustice as they may mitigate against them. This is the point of departure for Just Tech, a program that intends to provide an intellectual counterweight to the types of techno-utopianism, techno-solutionism, and techno-chauvinism that have predominated in the tech industry and in government and are not without favor in the academy. Moreover, we recognize that the harms of technology are neither singular, nor are they borne equally by every member of society. Indeed, a technology may work very well for some while being extremely harmful to others. And it is not uncommon that the first folks to ring the alarm about the downsides of technology are precisely those for whom technology pose risks or threats or manifest harms because technology was not designed with them in mind or the tech was designed with them in mind, but without them in the room, or with them in the room, but without an equal voice. It should not be surprising then that it has been women, people of color, women of color in particular, folks with disabilities, folks who do not conform to the norm, who have been the first to say, this tech doesn't work as advertised, or worse, despite what you've heard, this tech is harmful. And it's been these intrepid researchers who have come from disciplines that at times don't speak to each other. Sociology, communication, computer science, library and information studies, and increasingly from communities of practice external to the academy. Today, those contributing critical research and analysis to the, and analysis to the disparate and disproportionate impact of, of, of tech are also journalists, artists, activists, and tech workers themselves. Thus, given the interdisciplinary and intersector nature of the tech and justice research space, there are distinct risks also of knowledge silos. The Just Tech program responds to these problems in two ways. The Just Tech Fellowship, which we announced back in November, a two-year full-time fellowship that will give robust uh, uh, awards uh, and, and a variety of, of other resources to convene luminary research, researchers and practitioners from across these sectors to imagine and create the tech futures that we need. And we'll give a brief update on the fellowship timeline at the end of this program. And the Just Tech platform, which we are delighted to launch today. The platform is the second instance of the Council's Research Area Mapping Platform, or Research AMP. A few years ago, Colleagues at SSRC built a public resource that some here may be familiar with. It's called MediaWell, which uses tools like Zotero and Press Forward to aggregate, curate, distill, and archive research on what was then the burgeoning field of information disorder, disinformation, and misinformation studies. In the year since, in, in the year since MediaWell was launched, we've endeavored to turn this framework for research curation, translation, amplification, and archive into a modular plug and play tool, a platform that organizations will be able to adapt for their own use. If you'd like to learn more about Research AMP, including how you can apply for a $30,000 award to develop a Research AMP partner site, please follow the link that we just dropped in the chat. 
The Just Tech platform builds on the model established by MediaWell and will aggregate, curate, translate, and archive research at the intersection of tech and social justice. The platform will amplify research from a range of disciplines and practices and communicate it to broad audiences that may include journalists, funders, students or researchers, uh, or researchers who lack subject expertise but want, who want to understand the state of research on a given topic. In everything we do, we are thinking about how to make research accessible to folks outside of a narrow research community or community of practice. Consistent with the goals of the Just Tech program, the platform will center the research and work of folks who have contributed so much to this field, but whose voices are often underrepresented and undervalued not only within the academy, but within broader public conversations about the role of tech in society. In so doing, we hope to bridge gaps in research networks that are necessarily interdisciplinary and cross-sector. Moreover, we hope that the platform will allow users to make these connections themselves, to zoom out from individual papers, books, or scholars, and to situate them within a larger conversation about tech and justice. Finally, we hope that the platform will give researchers an opportunity, not simply to trace the contours of a variegated field, but to project where the field needs to go next. Of course, this is an opportunity not simply for researchers, but also for journalists who need background for a story, for funders who wanna know where to direct, direct resources, for policymakers who wanna know what the knowledge base is that underpins a legal or regulatory issue, or for students doing research for a term paper. These, the Just Tech Fellowship and the Just Tech Platform are the two pillars of the Just Tech program. With the fellowship, we are investing in the next generation of thought leaders in the field of tech and social, ju and social justice. And with the platform, we synthesize and communicate the base of knowledge in this field and showcase the luminaries who re whose research and work continue to move the field forward, including soon the first cohort of Just Tech Fellows. This, in very broad strokes, is what we are trying to do. And with that, I will pass it to Catalina Vallejo, Program Officer for the Just Tech Program, and Amanda Kaskazi, ACLS Leading Edge Fellow and Program Officer for Just Tech, who will show you how we intend to do it. Thank you, Mike. Um, now, Amanda and I will give a brief demo of the Just Tech Platform's content and functionality. Uh, so please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A window. We will answer as many as uh, we can before the end of the program. Now, um, the platform features a variety of content and the home screen is organized according to these content types. Um, in just a moment, we will touch on each one of them in greater detail. But as you can see, the list includes field reviews with the most recent tree feature on the homepage. Uh, we also have essays and interviews. Uh, the Just Tech Network, which includes researcher and practitioner profiles, field notes, which are curated third-party content relevant to users of the platform. Uh, we also have a calendar of events. Again, it is a curated list of events relevant to um, Just Tech users. And finally, we have a citation library that is powered by Sotero. Um, the Just Tech Citation Library is created uh, is a created database of over a thousand unique citations, including peer review articles, books, conference papers, reports, and also news articles. Um, all the content on the platform is sorted into one or more of our eight research fields. These are listed on the left side of the homepage menu, and they correspond to subjects about which we think the tech and justice nexus is the most fruitful for exploration and critique. Um, here you can see that we cover subjects from carceral technology, to movements and mobilization, to platforms and infrastructure. And when you dive into, for example, um, the law and ethics research field, you will see any content tagged with that field um, description. And just a second, we're going into the law and ethics um, research field, and you will see there that it includes um, field reviews, articles, uh, members of our network, relevant field notes, and recent citations. Um, okay, now 
I'm gonna move to the field reviews. And um, I would like to talk briefly about the field reviews and what are our main goals with this type of content. So um, just tech field reviews are critical entry points into research and tech on tech and social justice. Each uh, review is a brief agenda setting summary of research on specific topics, such as black mobile journalism, hacking and tech entrepreneurship from the global south, or the role of carceral technology in American history. And field reviews allow authors to tell a story about where research has been, and then argue where research must go next. And above all, they are intended to be both rigorous and accessible. Each field review is written by an expert in their field and peer review by two additional experts, after which they receive robust editorial support to ensure that they will be useful to audiences from journalists to policymakers to organizers and educators. And we are delighted to have already published six of these field reviews with several more forthcoming. We want to take this opportunity to encourage you to take a look, to read them, to share them, and to send us um, your thoughts about what topics you would like to see next. And to date, um, all the field reviews in the pipeline have been commissioned, but we anticipate a open calls um, in the future. And here, you can see now a field review by Roderick Crooks about the role of technology in educational settings. This is a critical analysis of the digital divide research. And as you look through a field review, you will see that each citation is hyperlinked to a unique page in our citation library. And um, each citation page, when you click on those, um, includes um, author, um, publication information, a brief abstract, a link to the original source when available, and also a link to the citation in our public Sotero library. And to date, we have compiled over a thousand individual citations, um, each sorted into folders that correspond to our research fields, to each one of the individual field reviews, and one folder including citations from every member of the Just Tech Network. And um, our Sotero library is growing every day, and we encourage you to play with it, share it, or adapt it to your needs. And now I want to pass it to Amana. Thank you, Katha. So in addition to the fabulous field reviews that we have, the platform also features essays and interviews that offer a fresh perspective on the current and emerging topics from members of our network. Consistent with our aim of reaching and engaging with as broad of an audience as possible, the Just Tech essays are a short reflection uh, that allow network members to take a research-based position on emerging topics at the intersection of tech and social justice. Alongside the essays, we have interviews. Now, because the lived experiences and personal histories of the people in the Just Tech Network are often so intertwined with their work, it was critical for us to not only communicate their work and research, but humanize it. Interviews allow the network members to tell their origin stories, career trajectories, their challenges, and their victories. Today, we are delighted to share four essays and four interviews with many more to come. Another exciting feature of our platform is our network. Every member of the Just Tech Network has the option to create a researcher profile. You can search through all of the profiles or by the research field of your interest. These profiles showcase the amazing people in our network, but also provide an entry point for users who may be interested in reaching out to make collaborations and begin connections. So for example, on Desmond Patton's profile, you can see that these uh, profiles offer a rich entry that include photos, bios, Twitter handles, personal websites, as well as upcoming events he'll be taking part in, content created for the platform, and links to any citations included in our public Zotero library. The final two features of our platform are intended to curate third-party content from around the field. Field notes are a collection of new and noteworthy content from across the web and can be anything from essays, editorials, scholarly articles, 
book reviews, news articles, podcasts, um, and even announcements of forthcoming work, conferences, and grants. These field notes highlight our commitment to ensuring that the platform serves as a resource for the most up-to-date content and provides a wide array of perspective on our research fields. And lastly, the platform features a dynamic calendar that is updated with virtual and hopefully soon uh, in-person events that are of interest to our Just Tech community. Before I turn it back to Mike, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge our advisory board and funders. The Just Tech program is supported by our advisory board, which is comprised of a diverse interdisciplinary and intersector group of leaders that help guide our program's initiatives. The Just Tech program is funded by the MacArthur Foundation, Ford Foundation, Serdna Foundation, and Democracy Fund, whose support help make the program and platform possible. In short, the Just Tech platform is a free to use public resource intended not simply to map a field of research and practice, but fortify it. Through original content and by gathering, publicizing, and sharing resources, the platform will act as a bridge and a point of entry for an increasingly interdisciplinary and intersector network of scholars and practitioners. We hope that you use the platform to support and amplify the important work and research and people that are working at, towards a more just technological future and that you explore the platform today and continue to come back for inspiration in your own work. I'm going to turn it back over to Mike, um, who will be introducing our panel of speakers now. Thank you, Kata and Amana. And now it really is my distinct um, pleasure to introduce Dr. Alondra Nelson, the Harold F. Linder Chair and Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, I gave the big introduction at the top, so I'm going <laughs> to give the abbreviated one now. But as I was saying, back channeling this, you know, this is truly a demonstration of unjust technology. This is not, this, it wasn't right how this worked out, but uh, we keep it moving. And, and we're so glad to have Dr. Nelson um, back with us today. Uh, Dr. Nelson, again, leads the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy was the 14th president of the Social Science Research Council and did serve on that steering committee that brought us Just Tech. Dr. Nelson, welcome back to the SSRC. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Sorry uh, to have had tech problems. I'm trying to get with all of you this afternoon. Um, I want to make sure that I'm clear that I am uh, speaking briefly uh, this afternoon in my personal capacity um, and not as a representative of the federal government or the White House. So I am delighted to see this day come. I remember many conversations with the steering committee, with members of the SSRC staff, um, and with many of you as we tried to imagine the thing that we needed to make our work thrive, uh, to, for it to live, and to use the word that Amana used that I thought was so wonderful, to fortify our work. If we could imagine together uh, in community, the platform, the infrastructure, the tools that we needed to do the work that we wanted to do to imagine more just technology in our world, what would that look like? Um, and the result is in part just tech, which is an extraordinary uh, platform that's premiering today, um, but also an extraordinary new way of thinking about how we support work in the world. So these are fellowships that take the whole person. And it was really important for us to, uh, to imagine a fellowship that took the whole person and also considered research and engagement in research uh, broadly, uh, take up the work of practitioners um, and artists as well. And to do it at a level of resource and a level, a level of support uh, that demonstrated how seriously the challenge and the opportunity for creating Just Tech was. And so I am uh, excited to be here and for the launch of the platform because it really, I think, is best in class. And I hope it will be a model for um, all sorts of, of new kinds of fellowships and projects and platforms. Um, uh, as, I, as, as I heard was just said, uh, the platform is, is a tool um, and it is, you know, building a field, but it also really is creating community and drawing together 
people across fields, across experiences, across methodologies and modes of work from artistic creation to data analysis to really think about what it means to um, mobilize technology um, and have an, a vision for technology that really leans into and places issues of justice and access and really the use of technology uh, for the good of our communities and for the good of society uh, at first and foremost. So um, I just wanna salute the work of the Just Tech team. I, folks should also know that this was done with so much intentionality. So this is a fellowship that you know, could have been stood up in a few months time, um, but, but we really took our time and I shouldn't say we, they, the team, um, uh, which I've not been a part of for a while, really took its time and thought through every facet of it. And in a few instances, went back to the drawing board to reimagine what it would look like to create a platform and a program that lived up to its name, Just Tech. So um, I just wanted to say a few, those few words, Mike, to get you to at, at the top. Um, and I wish everyone um, congratulations on the platform. And I'm proud and honored to be a part of the network and can't wait to, to use it and to work in community with all of you, over. Thank you, Andra. Um... That, that that's amazing. I and um, I'm, I'm, I don't want to tear up here, it, but, <laughs> but it, it's it's great to have you on on at this event and to hear those words um, um, and and to remind us of, of of what a long journey it's been to to get to this point, and we've got a lot further to go. So thank you. Uh, now again, it is my my pleasure and my privilege to invite our our, our whole panel uh, up, and I'll introduce them now, and 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 then let them take it away. Um, so, panelists, if you will, please come on screen now. Uh, okay, today we are joined by. Uh, three brilliant women, each a scholar and an activist in their own right, uh, who to my mind have done more to democratize knowledge about the uneven harms of tech than just about any group we could have on, on this, this stage. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled to introduce them. Dr. Ruha Benjamin is professor of African-American studies at Princeton University, founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab and author of the award-winning book, Race After Technology and the forthcoming book, Viral Justice, How We Grow the World We Want. Her work investigates the social dimensions of science, medicine, and technology with a focus on the relationship between innovation and inequity health and justice, knowledge and power. She is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including from the American Council of Learned Societies and National Science Foundation, as well as the Marguerite Casey Foundation 2020 Freedom Scholar Award and President's Award for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton. Welcome, Dr. Benjamin. Dr. Timnit Gebru is founder and executive director of the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute or DARE Institute. Dr. Gebru was famously fired by Google in December 2020 for raising issues of discrimination in the workplace where, ironically, she had served as co-lead of the ethical AI research team. Dr. Gebru is an expert in algorithmic bias and the ethical implications underlying projects aiming to gain insights from data. Dr. Gebru also founded, co-founded Black in AI, a nonprofit that works to increase the presence, inclusion, visibility, and health of Black people in the field of AI. And this discussion, uh, uh, I'm sorry, welcome doc, uh, Dr. Tim Nick Gebru. Uh, and this discussion will be moderated by Dr. Safia Noble an internet study scholar and professor of gender studies and African-American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Noble serves as the co-founder and co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, or C2I2. Um, Dr. Noble was recognized as a MacArthur Foundation Fellow for her groundbreaking work on algorithmic discrimination, is the author of a best-selling book on racist and sexist algorithmic bias in commercial search engines, Algorithms of Oppression, and as of this weekend, is the inaugural recipient of the NAACP Archwell Digital Civil Rights Award. Dr. Noble, the stage is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. And um, I can just think of no better way to spend the first day of Women's History Month, uh, Women's History Month, than with this group of people. Um, I'm so thrilled to be invited by uh, SSRC and to follow in the footsteps of the great Alondra Nelson. Um, I know that this is going to be a good time. I'm already uh, just like hyped about getting to talk with Ruha and Tim Neat today. So let me just say that um, by way of my introduction to my own experience with Just Tech, that, uh, you know, one day I got a call a couple of years ago and there was going to be a convening of Black scholars who we're going to be asked our opinion about how hard it's been for us to do our work and what do we need to um, make things better. Now, I will tell you that's a call that is a rare call indeed. And many of us know that um, the struggle to get our work taken up and taken seriously in the world um, especially because we are embodied in these Black women's bodies and experiences um, and the incredible barriers that we have experienced along the way in our careers and in our lives to being heard, to being taken seriously, um, to get a call from funders saying, we want to make something like a, a, a fellowship that would allow and address and kind of um, support um, the things that you think are important uh, that would have made a difference, let's say, in your own careers is an extraordinary call indeed. And so um, that is one of the ways that I was brought into this conversation. And I was so grateful to see the way in which Dr. Nelson really helped organize the team at SSRC to hear our voices when we said, listen, um, when, when fellowships come from large scale foundations and they have to go directly into our institutions, into our research budgets, that precludes us from being able to spend those dollars on childcare, for example, which is what we really need um, in order to write the book or get the research done or elder care because we're taking care of parents who need our support. Or maybe what we need is um, uh, sh things shored up in our lives because we are um, living precariously as postdocs or assistant professors in the early years of our career where I can say for myself, moving to Los Angeles on an assistant professor salary at UCLA was an, an, an impossible task. Indeed, that created so much anxiety financially and precarity financially that it was difficult to write. Um, so those kinds of conversations, um, the, the, the true kind of structural dimensions of what women and people of color, people who are um, already kind of in the margins and, and need support around all kinds of other things that are beyond the scope of our specific jobs and roles um, in our institutions, that kind of support is tremendously important. So I just want to say thank you to Dr. Nelson, to Dr. Miller, the whole team at SSRC, the funders um, for listening to Black women listening to people of color and letting us have an opportunity to shape the direction and the, and the future of possibilities that could come from the kind of support that this, uh, that this future um, um, that we imagine could be. So um, let me also just say that uh, to get to be on a panel, first of all, I can remember in my own experience as a graduate student and then as the lone Black professor in my department um, along the way in my career, uh, how, how difficult it was to find other voices and other people. And so I feel personally so grateful. I'm kind of moved um, emotionally to have found Dr. Benjamin and Dr. Jabru along my way. Um, and, and what um, support means in this just tech kind of um, framework 
um, not only is about finding the research and finding the citations, but it's about finding community because many of us, we know, and um, to meet your career at Google has been so instructive for us um, that no matter the kind of prestigious positions that you might one day attain, you are always just one statement away from um, uh, annihilation, if you will, or being fired, or um, um, when you are allegedly here to speak truth to power and to just provide the evidence of the things that you are so blatantly wrong or where the injustices are, um, you can be made disposable. And I know that many researchers who are not tenured, and there are so many researchers, students, activists, journalists, people who work in companies, people who don't have, let's say, the kind of safety net that a tenured job would provide you, um, are even more vulnerable in trying to do this work. And so I just want to acknowledge that um, our witnessing of what has happened to you is a reminder that um, the strength of our community to wrap around each other, to hold each other up, to pull each other through is so incredibly important. And so I'm just grateful that um, we are um, in this moment where we can have resources wrapped around us to help us find our way. So with that, that's my um, uh, just my opening remarks about uh, how I'm thinking about this day, how I'm thinking about the launch of this platform, and that it's really not um, just the platform, although the platform is incredibly important. It's about a recognition that the boulders, we have pushed up mountains to make certain kinds of um, harms visible, have, um, have been um, uh, we are standing on the shoulders of so many other scholars who, and activists and um, mothers and grandmothers uh, who came before us, um, who have um, whose traditions of um, of, uh, of 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 foregrounding civil and human and sovereign rights um, are are in us in each of the three of us I know. And so, let me just kind of open this conversation up and say. Um, you know, what is this, this day, this launch of this platform, this kind of time that we brought um, into focus here to talk about the intersection of social justice and technology? What does it mean for each of you um, today as we kind of start this conversation? And, and um, to meet, I'm going to start with you and then um, uh, Professor Benjamin will kick it next to you. I was going to ask Ruha to go. <laughs> okay, okay, Ruha, you go first. Whatever you, you want, whatever you want. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm just, you know, it's, I'm just thrilled to just see your faces and to see everyone else, the participants whose faces we don't see, but the energy is real. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about um, Alondra's opening and just thinking about the idea of sociality that she's written so much about, sociality and self-fashioning. Those are two words that are coming up for me. I think what we have here is much more than a platform. The platform may be the beginning, but what I see it as is as the beginning of a new ecosystem. And I like the language of ecosystem more because it evokes life, different life forms. I'm thinking about um, some writing by the sociologist, the late sociologist, Eric Olin Wright, when he was talking about how his kind of vision of social change and social transformation, and he evoked this language of an ecosystem and how there's all these different life forms in a given habitat, but there's also a dominant a dominant life, a life form that takes over. And he's talking in that context of capitalism, but we could apply it to racism, ableism, heterosexism, et cetera. But the kind of domination within a particular ecosystem and what he describes as change is when you introduce alien species into an ecosystem and foster those alien species, give that those alien species what they need to thrive, to live until they can grow and eventually take over and take over the mainstream of the ecosystem and push out the dominant form. And so what I see here, the, the, the Just Tech platform producing or helping to incite 
is that kind of fostering of alien and alienated life forms. You know, we can think about what that means. What, what has been alienated in the context of society and technology and how do we foster the growth? How do we feed it? How do we water it and grow until it can live on its own and eventually push out the dominant life forms that's really um, suffocating and, 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 and you know, um, extracting so much from us. And so, I think what we have here is the beginning of something really important, but I also, in that metaphor, what is, what's vital is that we, we do the work. We can't just throw up some website. We can't just put it out there and just assume that it's going to operate on its own. We each have a responsibility in our organizations in our advocacy to nurture the thing that we want to grow and to live, we have to actually be intentional and in continuing the intentionality that's already been put into the platform. Um, and so I could say more, but th that's what comes to mind for me is a kind of self-fashioning, self-determination, and ultimately this idea of open futures. How do we open futures or create more potential for all of those things that have been alienated to thrive and to grow? Absolutely. To meet, how are you doing today? I'm great. I mean, you know, it's, I always want Ruha to go first, but then after she goes, I'm like, I can't. Why did I do that? She drops so much. No. That's how I feel too. <laughs> it's always like that. Um, <laughs> of course, I can't stop smiling because I always love talking to you. And um, I, it, I was just resonating with everything both of you were saying. So I've been trying to talk, I've been trying to learn from the Just Tech Fellowship. Um, I've been trying to talk to some of the people involved in it, like Mimi Onuha, we just talked last week. Um, and yeah, the, the, the process that went um, to make this thing a reality, the intention with which uh, they did it. I remember I heard about it like a couple of years ago. I don't even, and um, you know, so they took their time. And um, sometimes, I think many times we overcomplicate things in the sense that, you know, when you want to um, get something done, the best way to do it is get resources to people, right? So we say, okay, like, mm -hmm. oh, how, so to me, people say, oh, you were so brave speaking up and how did you do it and all of that? Well, if I had no health insurance, um, like, you know, if, when I was get fired, if I could not put food on the table, if I had if I was going to lose everything immediately, if I didn't have any sort of safety net, if I didn't have community, et cetera, there's no way I would have made that decision. Mm -hmm. And I would never have told somebody else to make that decision. Right. Mm -hmm. So really what it was, is about resources. Mm -hmm. And so if we want the outcome that we, that we want, we have to create the incentives for that outcome. And so we just have to put resources, to the, give resources to the people, right? And so I see so many people applying to the Just Tech Fellowship, which means, I mean, so many people I know have been applying, which means that it was, you know, it, it's the, a very important thing that we didn't have until now. Uh, and we know so many people who are doing, um, you know, the gig workers who are, who have, made so much change but they have to um sleep on their friends couches right mm -hmm. and because they don't have any resources um you know i'm happy that at dare we raised what uh, 3.7 million dollars but then i know that some random dudes in silicon valley have raised 150 million dollars mm -hmm. to do ethics or whatever with no the <laughs> with no track record so the money is there the money is there. We have the resources to give it to, to the people who are actually making change. And so if they don't have that money, they're not going to be able to have that space to imagine the futures that all of you have written about, right? That we, we have to give them that space. So, um, you know, I'm just happy that 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 this fellowship exists. And I'm um, trying to learn from it to see, you know, what we can do uh, at DARE that, um, to kind of be part of that ecosystem as well. Yeah, I love that you said that to me because I was thinking about the night that we were all online on Twitter witnessing what was happening to you. Mm -hmm. And I remember that the first thing that came to my mind um, was reaching out to you. I hope you don't mind that I share this, but yeah, I, I was going to share it actually. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, I mean, because this is kind of the things that people don't see about, you know, they might see the three of us in our work and kind of know us by our work and our writing, our speaking, 
But um, what happened in real time was I hit you in a DM and I was like, do you have money? Are you okay? Are you going to like, I will hire you tomorrow at C2I2 at UCLA because I want to make sure you had healthcare and that you could eat and that you were going to be okay. And of course, like, you know, it didn't occur to me like, okay, she's leaving Google. She's probably totally fine. But also um, I would have made that kind of extension again. um, And I know Ruha for you, like making a, a, a lab um, for me, making a center for you to me, making dare uh, this just tech fellowship. It really is about the kind of mutual aid that is that enables us to do our work. And I think that is something that is incredibly underdeveloped in the funder space. Um, I see all of the time when black women, when people of color, Um, are given resources, the first thing we're trying to think about is how many people can we hold up with those resources? And that is a very different model than, let's say, the dominant paradigm in the tech sector, um, in the corporate sector, which is how much money can we amass to hold just ourselves up? Um, So that, that kind of ethos is really important. And I wonder, you know, as we are entering, I'm just going to say, you know, you know, I wrote a book called Algorithms of Oppression. So I, people say that I'm the pessimist. I'm not really the pessimist. I think I'm the realist. I, I just kind of look at what's happening. I look out and I see, um, you know, more than 20 people in QAnon running in the next midterm election. I see Republican um, generals on MSNBC saying they have credible evidence that there'll be a coup d'etat after the next presidential election. I see the invasion of um, Ukraine and I see, quite frankly, white people becoming refugees. So that tells us a whole lot about what's happening in the world, how geopolitics is happening and how politics are happening in the United States. And I think about... Um, the next couple of years, the next decade of our work, the work of making visible the threats to democracy, the threats to civil rights, the threats to human rights, the threats to sovereign rights, and what resources need to exist for people to be able to continue to do their work in repairing that, in healing that, in trying to stave the um, those kinds of collapses um, off. So I just wonder if um, if you would talk about Ruha kind of, um, I know you've written this new book and you're talking about imagining futures. And I know we are always imagining futures also in the context of like, what is so, um, what we're having to contend with and how difficult that is. And I just think it's important that we kind of ground that because people think um, money is the sole answer. Um, or like just getting your own personal needs, but those things about kind of connecting them up to communities and to societies is so incredibly important. And I just wonder what you're thinking about right now. I think things are going to get a lot worse, but I think one of the ways that we can use uh, this time is to to all of the things that you mentioned, knowing what we're critical, what we're against. But I think what we need to be investing in and experimenting with are the alternatives, the alternative models, the alternative tools, the new paradigms. I think oftentimes those of us who are critical of whatever status quo exists, we have to expend so much energy outlining all of the harms, showing all of the ways that it's these death making machines are operating, that we don't have the time, space, resources to carve out, to actually articulate, to think through what else do we want then, if not that. And so for me, it's really important in our um, articulation of what uh, just tech is, is that we have the critical mode and that we're also allowed to have the creative mode, the mode in which we get to imagine, experiment, mess up, (laughs) um, think through alternatives. And for me, what that looks like is a recognition that size is not always the the thing that we should be going for in terms of scaling things up. (laughs) You know, everything that's big is good. Sometimes we need to work and and practice things at 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 a smaller scale, whether you think about that locally. And so many of the 
just tech organizing that's happening is at local and regional levels. It doesn't necessarily jump to national and international sort of scale, but also just thinking about the new kinds of relations and practices that we want to engender and grow. We need to be, we need to have the time and space to do that. And so this is part of the provocation for viral justice um, is what does it look like to actually respect things at the small scale and to work on things at the small scale before we are have to do prime time or have to convince you know, um, some big, big levels of institution building. And so I, I will just put a plug in for those who are tuning in, whether they're in one locale or working in one like institutional context, perhaps they're experimenting with a new class that bridges the humanities and STEM. Perhaps they're working in an organization that's trying to put the concerns and insights of communities who are most harmed by the status quo at the center, driving the initiative. Whatever it is, I just want to shine a light on those seemingly small, insignificant initiatives and endeavors to say that's where the work is too. Because you know, as these structures are coming down and disintegrating and showing that they uh, do not work, we need to have in place other options, other alternatives, how else are we going to organize ourselves? And so I see that already in the way that the platform is set up, that there is a, a recognition and, and a space for that. But I also just wanna say, you know, for all of us to combine the critical and the creative and how we go about things and, and to, to just respect things when they're small, when we're seeding new ways of doing things. And, and that really has an important place in terms of transforming ecosystems. Absolutely. Um, to me, I know that your work with DARE has also been, um, you know, inspired by this kind of idea of bringing people together who otherwise um, don't fit into the dominant paradigm let's say, or reject the dominant paradigm that Ruha is talking about, right? That want to bring about a different um, set of possibilities and imaginaries into the world. And, you know, there's a lot of tension here because, um, you know, my own point of view is that not every technology, it's like dominoes, you know, um, not all money is good money, right? It's like, <laughs> not all tech is good tech. Um, and we have to think about, um, I, don't, I know some of you will understand that reference. Um, you know, how are you thinking about the, the just part of something like Just Hack in your own work? It's um, inspired by exactly what Ruha was saying, right? So um, DARE is, it's it's kind of both, okay, it's, it's kind of both, um, trying to think locally, but also uh, not being um, uh, only in the US, right? So you might think it's about scale or whatever that the fact that um, we're distributed, right? But for me, it's seeing that these tech companies are affecting the entire world. It's like an empire. And uh, we haven't gotten them to um, care about anything that uh, in countries that they don't think um, are important. So for instance, uh, I had been trying to raise awareness about um, what's been going on in Ethiopia, especially Tigray. And it, it's so, I mean, I don't want to, you know, it's, it's very important that we stand with Ukraine and people have been talking about, you know, have been having empathy for the Ukrainians going through all of this. But when I look at what's been going on in Tigray, the, the siege famine, 3 million people are about to, are, are, are might die because of this um, siege, you know, rape being used as a weapon of war. Then all of the issues because of climate change that have been happening all over Ethiopia, the wars that have been um, now part of, you know, that are in other states in Ethiopia and Afar and uh, Amara region, almost 70,000 Eritrean refugees unaccounted for, right? This is from a country that maybe is three, four million. And so every day, this is what we're, Every single day of my life right now, this is what we're going through. I don't know if my students are alive or dead. My friends are in hiding, family members, you know. So that you're forced to um, kind of devalue your own people's lives, I think, <laughs> in order to, to survive because you cannot get anybody else to understand. So um, in, in our team at Google, 
um, I wanted to hire people who could understand this kind of stuff. Because if you haven't lived it, it's it's so it's impossible to under to have that visceral reaction to understand um, the issues. I, so I wanted to give you an example. So one of them is um, Al Mahdi Al Mahamdi, who's a, a Moroccan uh, living in, in in Zurich. So. These are the multiple layers of issues we're dealing with, right? So Mahdi has been trying to get YouTube to take action on this channel called Truth TV. And this is the largest channel in Morocco. It has 20 million uh, Facebook um, followers. So 20 million followers is like all of the uh, the, the people, the uh, Moroccans in uh, on Facebook. Over 4 billion views. Um, and basically, a lot of research has shown this is the um, it's run by the Moroccan intelligence agency. They've been publishing p uh, private information, shaming people, harassing dissidents, jailing journalists. Some of his friends were journalists are um, in jail right now. And he was getting all sorts of threats on Twitter, on all, all you know, against his family, against his, himself. And then uh, Twitter would say, oh, this doesn't violate our policies. Right. So one of them, one of the threats I, I talked about it on my keynote and then the next day they took it down. But so. Um, oh, yes, I was just reading. Sorry, I, I just saw um, Ruha, I was just reading the Mihinti report that I think your lab was involved in too yesterday. So. Um, so anyhow, so we've been so I, 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 I understood and, and there. The UAE is involved, Russia is involved, same in, in Ethiopia, the UAE is involved, you know. And so now if people are understanding what Russia is doing, right? But if we really, if we, many times these are these things are a canary in the coal mine. If we did something about these other issues, we, you know, they wouldn't spread so much. So now the reason I mentioned uh, Mahdi is, so they haven't done anything about Truth TV, so we can't get them to, <laughs> we can't get people to understand the scale of this issue because who cares about Morocco, right? His sister is uh, was stuck in Ukraine because um, many Afro, like Morocco uh, is one of the, has one of the highest number of students in Ukraine. So on top of these threats and all of these things, he had to go uh, try to get his sister out of Ukraine. And you know all the issues like non-white people have been having. Right? So these are the multiple layers, right? And um, so for me, it's very important to stay local in some way because you won't get any insight. You, you can't even get anything done unless you're actually, you know, you're acting locally in some way. But it's also really important to understand the global um, issues that these companies that are in the United States are are having, and so as much as you know, the whole thing about Dare was to imagine a different future, but we are still stuck uh, dealing with these day to day things that we're trying to get um, urgent actions taken on. So I just wanted to give that example. It's kind of like so for Dare, yes, I, I really um, agree with the local um, thing because you know that's one of the reasons why we want people not to have to travel uh, from, you know, someplace to Silicon Valley or whatever, so they can stay in their own communities because they understand the context. But I think the distributed nature was also important in my view, because then you get to see how these large um, companies are affecting communities that you might not know about. Yeah, I really appreciate um, you're just bring, making known and sharing in this community the kinds of things that you're working on that we're thinking about because, um, you know, I was recently in a meeting and I said to some, uh, some of the people there who were recipients of a lot of venture capital funding and resources, I said to them, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of people have been given hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars to, go into the woods and have a retreat, dream up the kind of world that they want to live in, um, which might include launching their car into outer space. And then they, um, the rest of us get to live in a defensive posture from cradle to grave against those dreams, um, yeah. defending ourselves from those dreams that are um, nightmares, antithetical, hmm? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, you know, I think about what would it be like if um, Black women, if LGBTQIA+, if, um, you know, minoritized 
and harmed and oppressed people had the billions of dollars of runway, of time, of wraparound, of networks to imagine the futures that we want. Um, how different would the world be? And I say this knowing that so many of the people on this call, so many of the scholars, the journalists, the activists, students, people who um, have contributed to this community that we are making here, um, those who are with us and those who aren't, we have had to do like MacGyver that with like a Q-tip and a rubber band and like, you know, a piece of bubble gum, right? Um, and yet our work is always about the most expansive view of inclusion, of high quality of life for everyone in the world, right? Protection for mother earth, like all of the kinds of things that we imagine. And so I just say this for funders also who are on this call and who are listening that, um, you know, the model and the paradigm of uh, profit before people at all costs um, will actually, you, you know, annihilate um, all future possibilities for consumers. Um, because we see that with more and more investment of capital into the tech sector, um, we also see a corollary um, greater disenfranchisement of people around the world, um, greater and greater global wealth inequality. And so this is not a sustainable paradigm um, that we are in. And I think we have such a tremendous opportunity. My hope is that Just Tech will model for um, uh, the communities that we're part of um, a completely different radical imaginary from the one that we are in. And so um, with only a few minutes left, I guess I want to ask you um, each, you know, what's the radical imaginary of, of possibilities that are, um, that if we had the, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we could invest, um, what are some of the things that you think that this community of people um, could, um, could help bring about in the world? That's, that is the literally million dollar question. <laughs> um, you know, I am really, um, I, I run away from questions of um, where I'm the kind of sole prescriptive about what this vision is, because for me, part of the definition of what makes tech just is the process that we go through to arrive to what that vision is. It can't solely be the dream child of a few, even black women academics or practitioners. Like that is not even enough. And so really thinking about um, who's, whose vision, whose imagination is populating the future. It means even moving beyond academia, even if it's the, you know, the progressive side of things, it's still elitist in, in, in many ways. And so um, the process matters as much as the end point. Um, and so saying that, I will just put this out there so it might be kind of heretical in the context of the launching of this platform. But for me, what's also important in envisioning tech justice or just tech is that tech might not be the answer or the route to get to, to, to anything that's just. So I also wanna carve out space for just justice. <laughs> that, that is to say, tech is not always have to be in the equation of what we're imagining. And that to me is what makes it truly liberatory is that we also get to refuse um, technical answers, even when those have its place, even when it's subordinate to the more humane so social political demands. And so I just want to put that out there is that that future that you're asking me about is also analog. It's also, um, you know, old school. It's also, yeah. it, it's about relationships. It's not always the new biotechnologies. It's midwives where yeah. everyone has access to midwives. It's everyone can eat. Everyone has housing. It's all of the things that we already know. Um, and so part of, I think, what we always have to foreground here is not allowing, even as we talk about agenda setting, we have to be vigilant that in, in our agenda setting, technology does not always have to have a place at the table <laughs> um, in that. And so I just want to put that out there. Yeah, I love that because I know so many of the people who are, who are cited in the Just Hack um, platform 
we say those things too. So I love that because that it really is a possibility. Um, okay, to me, I'm going to let you have the last word here today. Oh, actually, I, I really don't have much to add to what Ruha just said. I, I was going to say that um, I think it was in your Race After Technology uh, book, I, I think it was towards the end where you talk about um, uh, uh, you just look at uh, people who earn one million dollars or more. Like they don't, they live in a borderless, uh, prisonless uh, world. I think you you made that kind of point, and it's that is I think what I could imagine, right? And many times when people talk about um, things that are that they consider radical, uh, they talk as if those are not things that happened in the past, right? There, there was a time when men, a lot of people could just cross borders without being surveilled and criminalized, um, so I'd, maybe some people. And so those are the kinds of worlds I think we can have. And tech does not have to be part of it. I hope that, um, what I really hope actually is that um, a lot of people are not in this constant defensive mode uh, that the tech companies or whoever else is building technology has to prove to the rest of the world that they're not harming mm -hmm. us before they put it out there so that everybody else can have a little bit of space to also imagine uh, what kind of future they want to have. Yeah, I'll, as I turn this over to you, um, Mike, I will just say that um, being with the two of you, um, being part of this conversation is so meaningful to me. And I know to so many of the people who are here watching, they tuned in to see the two of you. And so, um, you know, the, the thing that's so amazing about, I think, um, what we share in common is this, this sense of that, um, you know, if we look back over history and we look at abolitionists of, of many different um, types, it's always been a handful of people who have changed the world, who have changed the oppressive policies and systems and structures that we live under. And I want to encourage every single person who's here as a participant to remember, we don't necessarily need millions of people to make the changes that we want to see in the world, that every single one of our efforts, they do matter and they add up. And if we study those histories of abolition, we will be heartened and we will be encouraged by our solidarities and our power um, that is a small but mighty. So thank you both for coming and being a part of this conversation. Thank you, SSRC um, and Dr. Miller for inviting me to come and moderate. And um, uh, congratulations on the launch of this incredible new community. Thank, thank you. you. And, and folks who are still uh, here with us, please don't leave. I have a few words left to, to say. Um, First of all, thank you to our amazing panelists. I can't think of a better way to introduce this platform, this program to the world. I know you've given me a lot to think about. I'll be, I'll be combing through my notes and rewatching this video in, in the days and weeks to come um, as, as we're constantly rethinking how we can be the best that we can be. In the remaining time we have, I just want to th think about a few ways that people can stay engaged uh, with Just Tech and foreshadow some things on, on the horizon. Um, a lot of folks are asking how to become part of the Just Tech Network. You know, the the two best ways that you can stay engaged, and and just so you know, you know, folks who are represented in our network there are folks who have served on a committee, or reviewed for us, or wrote something for us, and or and and those are the um, the the people who are featured there. And so, one way to get involved is to write for us, do an interview with us, and and. And I'll talk about ways that 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 might happen. But right off the bat, please do follow us on Twitter. Follow, you know, a link to our 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 new Twitter profile should be in the chat. If it's if it's not there, we'll be there shortly. Please do also sign up for our our ma mailing list, and that link should be in the chat uh, shortly as well. And 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 via Twitter and the mailing list list, those are the ways that you're going to be able to find out about new opportunities from Just Tech. Uh, as soon as possible. Of course, don't ever hesitate to email us at just-tech at ssrc.org. Um, if, if any of your questions weren't answered today, please feel free to send them uh, to us by email. In the coming year, you can anticipate more programming like today's event, um, panels that feature scholars and practice 
practitioners focused on tech and justice issues. We're currently planning a fall convening on the principles of community engaged research that I know will be of interest to many who joined us here today. With regard to the fellowship, uh, I'll note that we received about 600 applications for the Just Tech Fellowship. They're being reviewed as we speak in May. You can expect an announcement of the inaugural cohort of Just Tech Fellows, six outstanding leaders at the intersection of tech and social justice. Of course, we have far fewer slots than were available than, than we had amazing applications, and we will continue to think hard about ways to engage with the many wonderful researchers and practitioners beyond the six that will constitute the first Just Tech Fellowship. Um, but by joining our mailing list, you'll be the first to learn about the next application cycle, which will begin in the fall. In the coming weeks, we will issue a call for proposals for folks who would like to write a field review for the Just Tech platform. As with all other contributions to Just Tech, this will be a paid opportunity. So please do sign up for the mailing list, follow us on Twitter and look out for that call. I wanna note that this Friday, Just Tech program director Greta Byram will appear on the podcast 99% Invisible with Roman Mars. The episode is part of 99PI series, The Future of Ellipses. Um, it, which examines digital redlining. Th th this episode will examine digital redlining and suggests a vision for how to build more just and healthy broadband ecosystems. The episode will feature Monique Tate and other leaders bringing just consentful community owned internet access to urban communities in Detroit, Baltimore, and New York. Um, and you can find that podcast ep episode on Friday on the 99PI website. I just wanna say one final word of thanks to our amazing panel for lending their time and their expertise to this event, for being the wind behind our sails as we set out on this journey. Of course, thank you to our funders, the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Cerna Foundation and Democracy Fund, without which this would not be possible. And, and above all, thank you to my team and the broader SSRC community who have and continue to work tirelessly to make this program what it is and what it will be. And, you know, to paraphrase Ruha, uh, you know, that we do want it to be a space for imagination. And I think that we've thought about what it could be and what it should be, and we continue. And with your feedback, um, we will continue to reimagine what it will be and, and try to create just futures, not just just tech uh, uh, futures, but just futures in, in their own right. So with that, thank you all. And we hope to hear from you soon.